Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to introduce you to our course in Islamic psychology. Islamic psychology is a new field. It is something which is lacking in most Muslim countries. We have psychology, yes, Western psychology, which has its own uh, basis and approach to understanding human beings, how they think, how they react, how they interact. Islamic psychology is based on the fact that human beings have a soul. Western psychology don't believe in the soul. They observe animals and the way that animals operate, they've drawn certain conclusions and they've applied that to human beings. But we are more than just animals. So Islamic psychology seeks to bring human beings into the holistic picture of life on earth. And this area of study is vital for the development of our institutions, I mean, even in businesses, even in the military or in whatever field. Psychology has a role. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah amma ba'd. My dear respected audience, brothers and sisters, I'd like to welcome you all to the second part of the Islamic Psychology webinar series organized by the Chancellor and founder of the International Open University, Dr. Bilal Phillips. My name is Safwan Ibrahim and I'll be your host for today. In the last webinar, for those who had attended, we learned quite a lot of things. We learned about the relevance of psychology in our daily lives, managing addictions and substance abuse through cognitive behavioral therapy, and also ways of providing psychosocial support during times of crisis. Today, my brothers and sisters, we will be delving into the theme, a very specific theme of perspectives of Islamic psychology. And we, we, we have the right experts and scholars lined up to en enlighten us with the knowledge. So please, my brothers and sisters, stay tuned till the end, because we will be having a Q&A session with one of our faculty members at IOU, from the psychology department, so start sharing your questions from now till the end. So we will look into them and have our member answer them, inshallah. So without uh, further delays, my brothers and sisters, I start off the webinar with the welcome, with having Dr. Barry, Dr. Cherno Omar Barry, the president and vice chancellor of the International Open University pro to provide his welcome remarks. Dr. Cherno, you're welcome. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. On behalf of the Chancellor of the International Open University, Dr. Bilal Phillips, I am pleased to welcome all of you to the second part of our webinar series on Islamic psychology. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, for those of you who might have joined us in the first part, the first part was dedicated to the Gambia, where the government uh, representatives were invited to speak on psychology and how it has some relevance to our daily lives. Alhamdulillah for today, we are going to have different other speakers. This time we are going to be more focused on Islamic psychology. Because Islamic psychology, for those who don't, don't know, has a very, very, very long history and he has some good relevance to Muslims in particular, but to the whole world in general. And therefore today, we are going to have as our keynote speaker, a very illustrious uh, professor, someone who is today considered as a master in the area of uh, psychology in, in general, 
but more specifically in Islamic psychology, who has published um, um, scores of books uh, in the subject. And this is none other than Professor Hussein Rasul, who is also the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences of the International Open University. At the same time, you will have uh, uh, among the speakers, Dr. Francesca Boca, who is the head of department of the uh, International Open University's uh, Department of Psychology. Uh, we will also have an invitee from Nigeria, uh, one of our uh, students who will be introduced by the moderator. Um, and we will have as a moderator, our brother Safwan, who is uh, uh, presently based in Malaysia, who is going to moderate the whole event. We will have the vote of thanks coming from um, Sister Aminata Jaite, the country rep of the International Open University in the Gambia. I am pleased, therefore, to invite you to join us during this webinar and then witness a discovery of what we will call Islamic psychology, for those of you who do not know, and eventually to have your own views and perspectives on the subject. And therefore, I wish you all a wonderful session. Stay with us to the end. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Omar Chernoberry for the um, welcome speech. And right now we will move on to the keynote speech by our dear Professor G. Hussein Rasul. A um, little bit of background of Professor Rasul. He is a professor of Islamic psychology and dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the International Open University. He is one of the leading academics in the areas of Islamic psychology and psychotherapy and involved in the development of the first BSc Islamic Psychology at IOU. He also developed the first university accredited certificate course in Islamic Psychology in Pakistan. And he is a fellow of the International Association of Islamic Psychology and the Royal Society of Public Health. And also a member of the International Association of Muslim Psychologists and other professional association. Professor Rasul has published over 120 papers and reviewed in, pe in peer reviewed journals and also works as a part time Islamic psychotherapist. So today's topic would be about psychology and Islamic tradition presented by Dr. Rasul. Dr. Rasul, you're welcome. <laughs> Wala Alihi Washabi at Marine. Call Rabbi Shali Shadri, why you say Ali Amri, Assalamu Alaikum, Warahmatullahi Wabarakadu. Welcome to this theme. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, Dr. Bilafali, Dr. Chanabari, and others who was involved. And I feel very privileged to come and talk to you briefly on the topic of psychology. Basically, my question it's a question. It's a, is it an Islamic tradition? What I hope to do in the next 15 minutes, inshallah, is to try to convince you that it is. Now, first of all, we need to think of um, psychology. We need to look at what the definition of psychology is about. I think we've gone through that before, uh, but just to the, the theme I want to talk about is what is um, what Islamic psychology? Most people think there's no link between psychology and Islam or the relationship between Quran and psychology. Or most people believe that as Muslim, we don't have a clue about psychology. So I hope to be able to answer in the brief moment I have to try to answer these particular questions. Let's first of all, go back to definition of psychology. It's important to remind ourselves about what psychology is and what psychology is going to be or need to be. Right, if you look at the history of it, the, the term itself, psychology, derived from the Greek word psyche and, and, and logos. Psyche mean mind and logos mean study. So when we define psychology literally, it's the psychology of the soul. That's what it was before. And then it went through different evolution, 
you know, went to the, the concept of the mind, people saying, you know, it was defined as the study of the mind. And then it went to the third stage of people saying, right, no, no, it's not study of the mind because we can't study the mind by introspection. We can study the mind, we can study the mental life. We can steal both phenomena and the conditions. And then afterwards you have John Watson came in the 1910s and said, no, no, we can't, we don't, can't study the mind again because it's not scientific. Then he called it basically the science of human behavior and experience. And nowadays people have gone back to study the soul. So, so we start from the soul and now a lot of people, even in secular Western psychologists are studying the soul. So we're going back to the soul. But to understand it, to understand Islamic psychology, now, of course, there are going to be a lot of de different definitions. There are many definitions of Islamic psychology, but a lot of people, when they define what Islamic psychology is, they define Islamic therapy and counseling. In my, in my latest book, you know, uh, this was done through a process of refinement. We came up with, 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 with a definition that it is a study, study of the soul, yeah, okay. And study of mental process and behavior according to the principle of psychology and Islamic sciences. Let me explain to you very briefly. So we believe from Islamic perspective, we believe that the soul drives human behavior. The soul drives human emotions, yeah. And the human psyche is not a psychological one. It's a spiritual one, it's a metaphysical one. So this include question of being, becoming, existence and reality. And also we study the seen and unseen. Seen, which is through observation and experimentation, but rather than the unseen, the hype, yeah? And which is, you know, an additional aspect of studying human nature or explain human phenomena or explain human nature. So in the conceptualization of Islamic psychology, we have aspect of the soul, cognitive, affective, behavioral process are it's studied with evidence-based paradigm, which means that we have, we still use, we don't reject any, we don't reject secular psychology or what I call Judeo-Christian psychology. No, we accept part of it that is halal, that is compatible with our own Akida, Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama, or which is congruent with Islamic principle and practice. So this, when you come across the study, you're going to find a lot of definition and they're going to be bound to have different definition because of orientation, of context, of different school of thought. Even within Islamic psychology, there is different school of thought, which probably we have to deal with it in another session. Let's move on to what Islamic, sorry, to Islamic counsel, psychotherapy or counseling. Now in 1996, uh, sorry, 2016, I define it as it's a form of therapy which incorporates spirituality in the whole process, in the therapy process. So what I'm saying that, right, we, we are in Islamic psychotherapy, we look at people holistically. We only look at the, at the psychological, social, emotional, but also we have the spiritual dimension, which is called holistic. So in a way, what we are doing with Islamic psychotherapy is using therapy that's based, that's congruent with Islamic belief and practice and add the spiritual dimension to it. Of course, like I say, like with Islamic psychology, there are many different, sorry, many different definition of it. And uh, this is a very popular book. It's popular in Turkey, it's popular. It's been translated in, in Turkish, in Baza Indonesian, is in Arabic, and also I think it's very popular in, in Russian Federation as well. Alhamdulillah. Let's move on to some hadith. Now, when we look at some people would say, right, but what's the relationship with the Quran and Sunnah and psychology? There's so much more. Let's look at some of the hadith. The Prophet وسلم, narrated that the region Nasir giving advice. So if giving advice is part of the Sunnah, this is part of psychology, especially psych Islamic psychotherapy, Islamic psychology, because in Islamic psychotherapy, you do need advice. You are direct here. You are a guidance, you are a companion, you are a facilitator. It's not being 
non-directive as client-centered therapy. The other hadith, uh, this is from Bukhari Muslim, another authentic hadith from Muslim about, you know, if you relieve a hardship, if you relieve Muslim a hardship, Allah would relieve your hardship too. And so, you know, the whole, I mean, this is just a couple of selected hadith, but there are many hadith which you can look at, you know. I know some people are looking at the 40 hadith to do with Islamic psychology. There's many hadith when you look at it and you understand it, and then you can, you can try to relate it to human behavior and experiences. Furthermore, or in addition, we can see Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was, is a role model for not only for Muslims, for the whole humanity, for all mankind. And he was a therapist in the sort of general sense. He didn't have a one answer for every questions. He paid up attention to people because of their level of talking, because whether they are, can be articulate or not, or, you know, and also Islam generally encouraged therapy, encourage consultation. If you put consultation as part of therapy, then it is. And also you could see people said, you know, it's, it's client Rogers, client-centered therapy that discovered empathy and understanding. No, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already done that with people. He empathized with people. It was non-judgmental. So therapy, psychotherapy or Islamic therapy was is embedded within the whole notion of Islam as, as a religion and as a way of life. Now, if we move to, uh, let's move on to the next slides. Inshallah. If you look at the Quran, many, many places where you see a lot of statements from Allah, these are interpretation of the meaning of it, you know, from Surah Al-Shra, from al san Al-Qaf, you know, and all these, they, they have, they show us, you know, about, about hearing, about vision. In fact, one of the professors said from Canada, he said, you know, if you want to learn about embryology, learn the Quran, because it will teach you a lot about fertilization and so forth, which move on to the next slides, which look, really look at the order of formation of the body. Yeah. And this is one of the greatest miracles of the Quran. And there's an elegant description of the origin you know, of a development and it, it's done step by step, stage by stage in terms of developmental stage of you intra within, intra mean within uterine life. And this is found in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. Now, modern embryology is a recent development, just new, because it didn't start until the invention of the microscope and that was in 17th century. Now. But it was 17th century, but that was that was in the Quran many, 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 many centuries before that. So it was the, if you look at the stage or the concept of human being being developed in stage, that was recognized much, much later, maybe in 19th century, that was recognized. But the Quran had this more than 1400 years ago, alhamdulillah. So we had, there's a relationship. There's a relationship between the Quran and the psychology of human behavior. There's a relationship between hadith and also about human behavior. Let's move on. Right. Next, if you look at nafs, the three types of nafs from different surah, from Yusuf and so forth. And these nafs are found in the Quran. The nafs the self. And it operates in one of those three stages or states. The nafs of Almara, the nafs of Mutmaina, and the last, sorry, the nafs of Lawama. So the Quran itself explained how these states command our psyche, commands our mind, and tell us what to do. Because these things control us, they dominate. So, for example, if you have the nafs of um, Amara, be soothed, 
It means that we are subjected by the self. We listen and follow its command. And these are, make us deviant anyway. So the, the stage describes the part of us that requires material possession, for example, even sensual desires. Whilst with Nath of Lawama, we are conscious of our own imperfection in this world. And we are inspired by not our brain, but our hearts. And we see the result of our action and our weakness. And we try to aspire for what we call ihsan, for perfection. And finally, the, the mutmaina, the, the, the naf implies serenity, sakina, tranquility, contentment and peace. And there, there's no immoral desires or even sensual desires. The Quran explained that. Now, some people, uh, secular people, or what I call Muslim Orientalists, trying to equate it with ego and superego. Oh, Astaghfirullah, no, we don't equate anything with anything else. The Quran said that, we accept it and explain it. In fact, somebody else, you know, who's written, Quranic psychology, a new branch of Islamic psychology, say there are fourth type of naf in the Quran. Uh, I'll, I'll, I don't know. We need to, to, to really dig into that. So what I'm saying is that these things are found in the Quran. We don't need to go further. Let's move on to the next slides. One of the most, you know, uh, people who say that, you know, Islamic psychology is a new discipline. It's not. It's never been. It's not new. It's something that happened long time ago, but developed further during the Abbasi period between the 9th century and the 14th century, which is known as Golden Age of Islam. That's why I think. As psychologists, we need to know history. We need to learn about culture. We need to learn about Islamic culture. We, we have a lot of heritage there. Because in the books, in the secular books, in the Judeo-Christian book, you're not going to see the narrative. You're not going to see Al-Balqi, Ahmad Al-Balqi, Al Ahmad Zaid Al-Balqi, or Abu Zaid Al-Balqi. You're not going to see his name. But he was the first ninth century and you know, he classifies symptoms, descriptions, predisposing factors and treatment modalities of OCD, obsessional concealed development. But also most important, he developed what is known as cognitive behavior therapy. Once I went to a class and I asked anybody, you know, well, some psycho, you know, a lot of most, most Muslim, they were saying, you know, who discovered who, they all say Wolf, you know, they also, you know, Beck, Alice. No because they learn this from secular, you know, people rewrite history according to their own particular belief and system and worldview. Muslim, we have our own worldview and also we have our own history. And Al-Baki is a person you have to mention that he was the first one who not only discovered or apparent, you know, CB, you know cognitive behavior theory, but also he also developed a number of you know, uh, treatment modalities. But one of the most amazing thing, which are still today amaze me, is when you look at the next slides, which is to do with DSM to explain it to people, for, for those who doesn't know anything about psychology, DSM mean, you know, diagnostic statistical manual. And the, the number five, there used to be one, two, three, four, and they take at least 10 years to develop these. It's like a manual of all the criteria for diagnosis. And you look at it and say, right, these people got obsession, the people got dissociative disorders, they got schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Whatever. Now, they took 13 years to do that. When you compare what they did, which took 13 years, not only this, but the rest of the manual, and Al-Baki, similar. Now, Al-Baki managed so that in 10th century, 10th, 11th century, already, made the criteria for OCD. And this, but the problem is we don't learn about Al-Baki, we learn about DSM-5. So when we search in the Quran and Sunnah and also from classical scholars, 
especially during the Golden Age, Razi, Al-Balkhi, Al-Ghazali, we found lots of richness of learning about human behavior. So, but also they were not just theorists, these people, they practically apply treatment. They were clinically involved. So it one does purely theory. Let's move on, if you allow me. This is the same. So basically, if you have time one day, have a look at this book, Sessions of, of the Soul, which is was translated by our late uh, Professor Malik Badri, uh, who was our father. Uh, he passed us away. Uh, Ella, give him if he does. He passed away, but he was the father of modern Islamic psychology. Let's move on. Uh, this, uh, I, this is just for a quick, we weren't going to go for it. This is show you, again, uh, it's divided into early Sufism and so forth. These are some of those people who has been involved directly or indirectly, you know, because Islamic psychology was not developed purely by theologians. It, it was developed by philosophers, the Al-Kalam. It was developed by physicians, but also it was developed by the scholars like Imam Tahawi, Maturidi and others, but also it was developed by, by um, theologian as well, you know. even Ibn Qayyim al Juzwiya and Ibn Tamiya and so forth. Okay, let's move on to the next. Probably finished by now. Oops. Now, this is interesting. When we talk about hospitals, Bimaristan, hospital at this time were known as Bimaristan. Bimaristan, you know, was built throughout the whole caliphate the, during the Abbasid period. Again, talking from 9th century to 12th to 14th century. I mean. And the first was built that mental health and psychiatry, I'm not talking about general hospital there, mental health and psychiatry was built in 705 AD in Baghdad, followed by Cairo and also Damascus. In fact, the building you know, is still in, in Cairo in Egypt. You can see the building still there. You know. And they had wards. You know what's for mania and psychological distress. Now, Bimaristan is a Persian word. Bimaris, sorry, Bimar mean, uh, from Middle Persian, is mean, mean sick, and Stan mean location. So Bimaristan location where the hospital was, that's what it is, it's a, it's a very much a Persian word anyway. So the Islamic world itself in its early years had a pondering approach concerning mental health and psychiatry. As I say, this was done under the caliph of Harun al-Rashid, but also, you know, uh, his successor, which was Ali ibn Malik. And, the, the, when you look at, when you compare it to the first psychiatric asylum in Western Europe, which is called the Bethlehem Hospital, I was fortunate to work there, and uh, it was founded in the 13th century. 13th century. Here we're talking about Baghdad, 8th century. After seven years, six years, sorry, after five years or so, that you had the first psychiatric asylum in London, in Bishopgate. The whole story is not there anymore, anyway, but in Bishopgate at that particular time. So, Islam, the, the, the whole treatment for psychiatry for human behavior were very well advanced because people were using all some mirrored of treatment. They were using medication, music therapy, water sound. You can see, you know, you have, this is actual hospital itself, you know, the, the, the image on the right. And you had the water sound bath, healthy, balanced diet. There was even bloodletting, cupping, talk therapy, talk therapy, which is known as psychotherapy, counseling. And it was done not by a single person, by a multi-professional team, a multi-disciplined team who care for the ill. And you know, the, 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 this dance the way that you know that they can the environment was designed in such a way to try to improve the quality of life of these patients. And some of them were in the workout board anyway. They were they, 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 people have food, people, everybody had 
Nobody had to pay. It was free. It was like a health service, like a national health service in the UK, free at any point of entry. Good food, everything else. And this was, we talk about ninth, eighth, ninth century, hundred. So much more to talk about, so much more to say. Now, this is just to show you that since 2014, the International Open University has developed a psychology course, Islamic psychology course, and these are some of our courses. We cover, this is a very unique courses. We cover courses that nobody else has ever done or tried to do because we don't just put psychology first, and then we add at the end some Quranic verses, which a lot of people do. If you look at all the courses, you know, or even not, not degree because nobody done it, but you know, all this professional development courses, they all do secular psychology and add a few, you know, spill of Hadith and Quran. No, we embedded, we integrate, you know, when we are teaching child development, we go back to the Quran. When we're taking embryology, we go back to the stress. The same, anything we do, we always embedded our evidence-based practice with psychology. So you can see, this is a range of portfolio. You know, you're not going to get that even in those Islamic countries that assert that they're doing Islamic psychology. No, IOU is the first one. He's delivering this type of program. Just to finish off, my question is, I want you to reflect. I want all of you aspirant psychologists, student of psychologists, psychologists, that my question is, are we still in the lizard hole? Now, the lizard hole is a, is, a, is a hadith from Ibn Majah. And it was used by professor, the late professor, Dr. Malik Badri, to explain that Whatever the Christian and, and Jews do, we follow the same. If they follow, the hadith said, if they go in a hole, we follow the hole, like the lizard hole. Anyway, that's what they call it, the lizard hole. So that's one. Are we still in that lizard hole? Now, when the first paper on the lizard hole was in 1969, more than 50 years ago, we still in the lizard hole. Most of the, especially I'm talking about majority Muslim countries, where, you know, like the late Malik Badri was saying, you know, we have a dissonance. We have a problem with dissonance. We go, we, we pray, we make wudu, we, we make uh, salat, we, we, we fast, we do everything, we go to the masjid. Yeah. When we come to teach psychology, we teach Jewish psychology, we teach Judeo-Christian psychology, we teach Freudian psychology, Oh, sometimes we call it the Muslim Freud. Why? So there must be a dissonance, the way we think and the way we behave with psychologists. So for me, we're still in the lizard hole. Second key, two minutes before I finish. Secondly, our educational program in universities, more westernized, I think sometimes they are. Some are, especially in Arab countries or even Islamic countries country, their program is more westernized than westernized. They import everything from America. There's a globalization of psychology. And what we are try trying to do, the movement of psychology, Islamic psychology, we're trying to decolonize psychology. We try to create an indigenous psychology to meet the needs of the Ummah. The Ummah is not one community. The Ummah is made of many Muslim communities with different ethnic group, language, and so forth. Thirdly, do our educational philosophies in Muslim countries reflect the principle of education? That whole start of the Islamization of Muhammad, if there was no Islamization of knowledge movement, there wouldn't have been Islamic psychology today, movement, say. Anyway. And finally, are we going to remain unconscious incompetence in the Islamization of knowledge? Now, you need to reflect on this. You need to write to sort out your cognitive dissonance. You talk about, you know, uh, Ahad, you talk about oneness of Allah, you talk about Tawheed, you talk about unicity of Allah, and then you associate Allah with partner by doing yoga, by doing mindfulness, which is Buddhism. So why? We do have a Muslim, we have a cognitive dissonance. 
which we need to look at it. And I will terminate my session now. Thank you for listening to me. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashar Allah ilan astaghfiruka tubale. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Professor Rasul, Zakla khair. Thank you so much for the inspiring and enlightening keynote speech. Appreciate it. Um, dear respected audience, inshallah, hope you found it's the same as well, enlightening, inspiring. And now we move on to the first discussion or first guest speaker for the day. And we have our very own head of department of psychology at the IOU, Dr. Francesca Boca Aldacre. Some background on Dr. Francesca. Dr. Francesca has studied cognitive psychology in Italy with a BSc and later specialized in neuroscience in Germany with a PhD. She is now a professor for Islamic studies at two universities in Milan, Italy. She also teaches Islamic culture at the Italian Institute for Islamic Studies, the only institute for continuous Islamic education in Italy. So her topic for today is the need for Islamic psychology, a paradigm shift. Dr. Francesca, you are welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you for having me here at the psychology event of the International Open University. What I would like to talk to you about is the need for Islamic psychology, and in particular under the light of a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is something much talked about when dealing with Islamic studies. And paradigm shifts are, in the classical definition of Thomas Kuhn, a process whereby a new way of perceiving the world comes into existence and is accepted by the scholars and the practitioners of a given time. Indeed, one of the greatest revolutions of contemporary Islamic studies has been to move away from the study of Islam to the study of Muslims. So disciplines like sociology or anthropology have risen to prominence while comparative theology, for example, has lost appeal. But what do Western Islamic studies have to do with the psychology? Well, we have to understand that when we usually call psychology, that is not a neutral, universally valid discipline. One might think that since psychology has to do with the way the mind works, and since the mind is a common element among people of all cultures and of all religions, that the psychological theories that are developed in Western world would unproblematically generalize as well to the Islamic world. The reaction of Western academia has been to advocate a value neutral position in all things that have to do with anthropology. So now, in Western universities, absolute judgments, for example, have to be completely avoided and a position of total relativism should be preferred instead. And although this approach has indeed freed the West from much of its prejudice towards other cultures, we must be aware that, as Muslims interested in creating an Islamic psychology, this might not work for us. What we need inside the Ummah is to cater for the mental health needs of Muslim patients who feel the need of putting Islam at the center of their identity and who trust Islam as a message which can contribute to their journey towards better mental health and when a cure is not possible as a tool to accept patiently their test. Islam is the central element of their life outside their psychological problems and Islam must also be the central element of their psychological health and their process of living it. At the International Open University, this is exactly our mission. Not only to create competent professionals who happen to be Muslims, but to create an Islamic-based version of different disciplines. 
from IT to finance to education. It is something that our Chancellor, Dr. Bilal Phillips, has repeated in many contexts, especially about the educational needs of the Ummah. We do not need educators who happen to be Muslims, but a fundamentally Islamic model of education. And teachers, of course, educators have a very big impact on the Ummah, but we shouldn't underestimate the impact that psychotherapists or educational psychologists can have as well. If we do not make a fundamentally Islamic model of psychology, the risk is to apply techniques which will not work. Let us make an example. We are a Muslim who is experiencing severe depression. Constant feelings of unworthiness cloud their mind, and they find themselves unable to perform their duties. For such a Muslim, one of the hardest parts of their situation is finding such a difficulty in making wudu, for example, or not being able to get out of bed for performing salat. Usually, a non-Muslim therapist would not understand the primacy of prayer in the life of a Muslim, and even if he does, his lack of competence on fiqh will not make him able to counsel his patient about possibilities which exist in Islamic jurisprudence that might facilitate absolving religious duties for those affected by such serious diseases. You can see that the role of the psychotherapist is not only to understand the importance that religion has in the life of the patient, but also to have the tools concretely to adapt the, to the situation of the patient and to provide a cure which incorporates these needs. Let's make an example from the opposite perspective. A non-Muslim therapist will understand some Muslim behaviors as being pathological. Well, they might not be. Let's say a female Muslim, Muslim patient come into a male psychologist's office and refuses to handshake. This could be, in the eyes of the therapist, a sign of social withdrawal. But however, as we well know, that is simply customary among Muslims to not shake hands with people of the opposite gender. So the first step would then to recommend the Muslim patients to choose Muslim psychotherapists. And this way, at least, religion-based misunderstanding would be avoided. However, for Muslim patients to be effectively treated, we need much more than to pair them with Muslim psychotherapists. We must develop a vision of the mind in accordance with the Islamic elements of psychology, with the parts that, in the understanding from the Quran and the Sunnah, constitute the inner workings of human beings, and that is their spirit, their ruh, their ego, the nafs, and their reason, the aql, and envision therefore methods which will put back into balance the components which have suffered pathologically. This is not only useful in cases of simple mental health problems. But let's imagine Muslim psychologists being able to counsel couples based on the marvelous stories that are part of the Sunnah, of the beautiful examples that are part of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or let's imagine a Muslim psychologist who can give us advice on how to educate our children based on the wisdom that the prophets in the Quran show towards their own children. Changing so radically the identity of a discipline is the a holistic process. Theory and practice must find the correct balance. If one component prevails on the other, we are faced with opposite risks. If we base Islamic psychology exclusively upon theory, we are renouncing to its identity of being an experimental science. And we are therefore risking envisioning a complete 
close the system, which is theologically correct, but factually ineffective. In other words, good on paper, but not working with the problems that Muslim patients would bring to the psychologists. But on the other hand, if we instead let ourselves be guided only by practice, we risk breaking the boundaries of the Quran and Sunnah and incorporating into our practice elements which harm both the patient's and the therapist's faith. This could be, for example, including reductionistic approaches and ignoring spiritual needs. If we're in a Western context, that could take this shape. But if we are in Muslim lands, this could even take the form of involving jinns or superstitions practices which are completely unacceptable for Islamic psychologists. So, Islamic psychologists is an Islamic discipline which keeps an ideal balance between studying Islam and studying the Muslims. What we have is now a roadmap for the next steps in developing the discipline. So it will proceed on two tracks and are seemingly parallel but are actually deeply intertwined. First, extracting from the Quran and Sunnah all references to human behavior normal or pathological, and organizing them into a coherent system. The other track is to try and test different therapeutical approaches based on the theoretical hypothesis, without the fear of falsifying them or of proving them wrong. I would like to insist that Islamic psychologists should have unshakable faith only in the Quran and Sunnah, and never in some author's understanding or in psychological theories developed by fallible people. In the footsteps of the great Muslim scientists of the past, we should never be dogmatic towards our own understanding, as it was clearly stated by Ibn al-Haytham, a great Muslim scientist. If learning the truth is the scientist's goal, then he must make himself the enemy of what he reads from other authors. So, evidence-based treatment, prioritizing spirituality, a theologically correct theoretical approach. These are the requirements for the development of Islamic psychology, and these are the next challenges we will have to face as Muslims in our efforts. To conclude, the field of Islamic psychology is exactly where our paradigm shifts come to significance. A new way of perceiving behavior and mental health, which provokes a change in practice, benefiting by it the whole community. So let's make dua and let's hope that these efforts will be successful. Thank you very much for your attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Francesca, for the inspiring speech. And um, my brothers and sisters, before we move on to the Q&A session, we have our final guest speaker, who is among the fruits of the IOU, a brother Musbahu Sadiq Aminu. He's a psychology graduate at the International Open University, where he graduated in 2018. While he was working as a nurse in a specialist hospital in Nigeria, and currently he is a ward manager at the same hospital. His topic for today will be about his thesis project, which he completed during his time at IOU. So with that being said, I welcome Brother Musbahu. Um, I'm Ismail Sadiq Aminu from Nigeria, a professional and registered nurse, and also a graduate of psychology from International Open University, The Gambia. I'm given these short recordings on the usefulness and uh, benefits of psychology to nursing profession and the nurses. Nursing is the fulcrum upon which other healthcare team disciplines rotate. And nurse is at the center uh, of client's care, through whom all the duties and responsibilities of other healthcare professionals passes to reach the client. So the nurse relate with the other healthcare team members in one their hand and with the client on the other hand. 
Scrutinizing this situation will delineate the dire necessity of a nurses to acquire sufficient understanding of psychology for effective discharge of their responsibilities and ensure the attainment of the client's goal. Through my psychological experience, I'm now able to be more effective in my nursing practice. When assessing my patients' conditions, I consider my patients' responses to their illnesses more effectively than before. With the help of psychology, I interact with my patients irrespective of their demography, socioeconomic, or political background more effectively. With the psychological knowledge I have, I'm now able to get the trust of my patients easily, which makes them more responsive to the instruction given to them. I'm now able to help my colleagues in the healthcare industry to give psychological needs of their clients the attention it requires, as their orientation was more of biomedical model. So we are now trying to inculcate the uh, biopsychosocial modem paradigm to them. With my insight in psychology, I'm now able to promote positive thinking in my patients. And uh, um, utilizing the principles of developmental psychology, I come to understand and uh, respond better to the needs of everyone I worked with on daily uh, interactions. My therapeutic communication is now more empathic and more effective. Given, the, given these realities, I often turn to principles of psychology to ensure the best possible outcome in my patient's health, communication, and daily relationship building. To end these recordings, I may say that with the psychological in, uh, insight I have, I can see now that I have what is termed as bed sign manners better than before thank you assalamu alaikum thank you very much brother musbahu may allah grant you success in your endeavors and my brothers and sisters respected audience we are coming close to the end of the session and now we will have the q a session and we have been looking into the questions that we are getting mashallah from the chat section we hopefully we will hopefully try to cover all of them during this 10 to 15 minutes inshallah and for that we have um sister hannah morris from the psychology faculty of iou a little background sister hannah morris sister hannah is educated to master's level in psychology having obtained masters in both psychological sciences and health psychology she has a keen interest in particularly in the fields of clinical counseling and health psychology and is particularly interested in research and teaching in these areas of interest. Sister Hana has over 10 years of work experience in the field of psychology, having spent much of her time working in health and social care settings. So Sister Hana, you can uh, come on stage, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for the kind introduction and jazakallah khair to everybody who's listening in and asking their questions now. Inshallah, I will answer some of the questions to the, the best that I can. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sure, we're looking forward to it, inshallah. So, diving straight into the first question that we have from our audience. Question one from Sada Ramiz. How our mothers be made familiar with positive human psychology, especially in the context of children, she and her family are entitled to take care. Okay, so I think my understanding of this question um, is in line with something that I've heard many times from people who say that perhaps they want to study psychology or that so how psychology can be useful in helping us to raise our children. Um, but some people are just... Um, not keen on it and just don't believe that psychology is a good thing for people to study. This is this is how I'm understanding the question. Um, do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so essentially, I guess, you know, and I think it's part of some of the other questions that have come up as well regarding the stigma that comes around studying psychology and this belief that perhaps it's not compatible with Islam. Um, and I hope today's session has been something that can uh, really enlighten people and open people's eyes to the fact that actually it is not in contradiction to Islam at all. 
Um, certainly you might have some um, concepts of um, psychology that are not compatible with Islam, but there are many components that are. And these are the components that we focus on um, in our teaching at the IOU. Um, so this is where it's really about trying to educate people on this because people perhaps have their eyes closed to believing that they, they could be compatible because perhaps they've seen some things uh, or heard some things about psychology that are totally against what Islam is. So it's about educating people on the fact that actually there is so much compatibility between the two, especially if we draw upon the things that Professor Hussein brought up at the beginning of the session today regarding actually how psychology was present already many, many years before the psychology, the secular psychology that we see today. And really to draw upon these things in educating and in you know, um, helping other people who don't believe that there's compatibility between the two and just kind of letting them know and educating them on how actually psychology can be very beneficial, especially if we draw upon it from the Islamic perspective. Um, so this is what I would suggest here, just, you know, educating them, you know, drawing upon specific examples from um, when we look at Islamic psychology with regards to raising children. Um, so drawing on particular examples of how we can apply these or perhaps how we see them practiced in the modern day and actually how this has been um, taken from um, Islamic psychology that we see in the Quran, in the Sunnah from many, many years ago before the psychology that we see, the secular psychology that we see practiced today. Thank you very much, Sister Hana, for the <laughs> answer. And um, inshallah, the second question, we have Sister Sadia who asked why we call it Islamic psychology specifically. Calling it psychology is not enough as it already means the study of psyche. The secular model doesn't talk about psyche, the soul or ruh. Please shed your view. Um, yes, I think you're, you're perfectly correct here. Um, again, as has been mentioned in today's session as well, um, psychology, secular psychology, um, you know, is not, doesn't look at the soul and the ruh as well, which Islamic psychology, that's what brings, that's what Islamic psychology brings to the table in addition to what we see with secular psychology. So yes, this is what would distinguish between Islamic psychology and secular psychology. So you might say that, you know, Islamic psychology is a branch within that as such. Um, so yes, we, you know, we call it Islamic psychology just to make it clear that we are also studying that additional element as well that wouldn't necessarily be um, studied in secular psychology and that perhaps um, typically when we hear the word psychology or of course in psychology might be thinking of secular psychology um, but that with Islamic psychology we are covering you know it from the Islamic perspective and looking at the role of the soul and the ruh in um, psychology as well. Sister Hana for your answer and uh, the next question from Salman Hassan. Assalamu alaikum. I have recently completed a postgraduate in applied psychology, but it had it was all Western concepts. How and where can I study master's course in Islamic psychology and counseling? Um, I actually don't have any suggestions off the top of my head. Um, as you're probably aware, we don't we offer up to bachelor's level in the IOU. Um, maybe there's prospects of um, doing masters in Islamic psychology moving forward, but as yet we don't offer it. Um, I guess like with every new uh, field, every new emerging field, it's something that comes in time. So um, if there are any courses globally, um, there'd be a lot less than you see in ba at bachelor's level or diploma level. So they are perhaps more few and far between at this point. So this is something I don't have an answer to immediately. I'm only really aware of up to bachelor's level. Um, but inshallah, this is certainly something that's evolving. We see more and more courses becoming available in the field of Islamic psychology um, than there were before as a growing field. So inshallah, um, we'll be seeing more of this in the near future. Thank you very much, Mr. Hana. And um, the next question, how do we advise people who refuse to reach out or help in their psychological issues because they feel that diminishes distrust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So how can we convince them that Islam allows us to look for cure along with relying on Allah? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is something that comes up quite often as well. I think part of this also um, taps into the stigma 
as well that comes with seeking psychological help as well. Um, so this doesn't really help the fact as well and doesn't really help the matter as well because there is stigma in seeking psychological support anyway, regardless of that. But also the additional feeling that this is diminishing the trust in Allah also provides another barrier to seeking support as well. But I think in this case, um, what we can look at it like is perhaps um, in the same way that we observe physical health as well. So when people are having physical health problems, it wouldn't be um, perhaps as usual because there's less stigma attached to physical problems. People wouldn't necessarily say, I'm not gonna take any medication. I'm not gonna have any type of medical intervention because this diminishes my trust in Allah because I'm gonna go ahead and do the have the treatment as well, but I'm also gonna put my trust in Allah as well. And the same goes for mental health as well. We should be definitely relying on Allah, but definitely we also need to seek the help for it as well. We need that. And this can help to support our relationship with Allah as well. Because sometimes when people are having mental health difficulties, this can help, this cannot help, sorry, it can actually make it difficult to establish that connection with Allah. So to get the help can help to promote a relationship with Allah. Because if you can solve your mental health problems, then this can make it a lot easier to connect with Allah. And likewise with physical problems, you know, maybe if you're having a lot of pain, it can make connecting with Allah difficult um, because you're so focused on the pain. Likewise with mental health, you're so focused on the depressive thoughts that you can't kind of commit yourself to Allah in the way that you would do otherwise. So if you get that psychological support and seek counseling and so on for this difficulty, it can actually open the doors to connecting with Allah more because you're, um, you know, getting rid of that cloudy vision that comes with depression. So it is very important to seek the support for mental health issues, just like it is for physical issues as well. So, I, and I think it's just the fact that there's more stigma around seeking support for mental health problems um, than it is for seeking support for physical health problems. But I think it's really important that we understand that psychological health and physical health are much the same in the way that we must deal with it um, in terms of seeking help for it from um, the medics, just as much as we need to do this, but also then put our trust in Allah in overcoming these difficulties as well. Thank you very much, Sister Hannah, for sharing some light on that. And uh, inshallah, brothers and sisters, we'll take two more questions here. Um, the last second question is by Mahir Saeed. Can you give us some tips on how to handle negative and sarcastic people? Okay, so um, given that there's no particular context to this, I guess I might start by applying it to what the context in which we've been speaking and that it's possibly the question has come to mind as a result of this so I wonder whether we're talking here about the negative and sarcastic people in relation to people saying perhaps they want to study um, psychology and the the stigma that might come from that in certain communities so it's again I think the focus on educating people actually about the importance of it um, and that Actually, there's no point in being negative and sarcastic about it because it is something that we know has been written in the Quran, it's in the Sunnah from years before modern day psychology. So to be negative and sarcastic about it is not the best thing on their part because they are almost negating something that already exists in Islam. So it's about, I guess, bringing them facts. Um, perhaps, you know, they're not educated on the facts that we see, we can, you know, there are actual facts in the Quran and the Sunnah about psychology and Professor Hussain enlightened us on some of those in um, his talk at the beginning. So you have some evidence right there and then um, that shows us that it was already written um, many years ago. So you have evidence to take to these people um, in that way. And, you know, sometimes it can be, um, Difficult to cope with being uh, when people are being negative and sarcastic about you know what you choose to do, but it's about being confident that you you know you know what and why you're doing, and that actually we see it written in Islam from all this time ago, and you know there is so much evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah as well about this, so you can be confident that actually what you're doing is the right thing, um, even if people around you are uneducated on it and they are being negative and sarcastic about it. Um, being confident that what you're doing is the right thing, you know, and, and we can apply this beyond psychology as well in the study of psychology, just generally in, you know, in the way beha we behave, the things we do, if we know that what we are doing, that we are doing it for the sake of Allah, you know, with 
with him in mind and everything that we do, we do it with taqwa, then it, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to brush aside the negative things and the sarcastic things that people want to say because you know that what you are doing is the right thing. It's in line with Islam. And you know, there's evidence for this as well. So it's about being confident that what you are doing is the right thing to do as well and that you're doing it for the sake of Allah. Zakla khair, Sister Anna. Last question for the day. Does Islamic psychology address things like PTSD, whether combat related or general traumatic events? Uh, yes, well, um, Islamic psychology addresses everything um, when it comes to psychological disorders. So there are, um, there are ways to deal with this and um, Muslim counselors, uh, Islamic psychologists are um, well trained to deal with um, all the different things that might be presented um, kind of to more general depression and anxiety to more specifics as well so things like post-traumatic stress disorder are things that um, people trained in psychology um, counsel uh, counselors trained in islamic psychology are able to support and be able to do so in line with islam as well all right thank you so much sister hana zakla khair for your time my brothers and sisters hope you benefited from that q a session and um, we have come to the end of the session, inshallah, with, um, before that, we hope you really benefited from the whole part one and part two Islamic psychology webinar. And I'd say, look forward to more from us, inshallah, from the IOU. And uh, till then, I pass it on to Sister Aminata Jaite, who is the Gambian representative of the IOU to, to give the word of thanks. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Welcome, Sister Aminata. Yeah. I feel honored to deliver this vote of thanks, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. An event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling weeks ago, and it requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of a very well motivated and dedicated colleagues at the International Open University who know their job and are results oriented. So on behalf of the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor and the entire IOU family all around the world, we say um, a very warm and hearty thanks to all of you for gracing this important event. Let me start with the conception of this whole idea of a webinar series, which came from the founder and chancellor, Dr. Bilal Phillips. Sheikh, the dream has come true, and thank you for dreaming. A special thank you to our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Hussein Rousseau, for his interesting expose into the topic on Islamic psychology. I must mention, with a deep sense of appreciation, to Dr. Francisca Buka for her insight into the need for a paradigm shift. We are further grateful to our IOU graduate from Nigeria, who is no other than Brother Musbahu Sadiq Amin, for his contribution towards the discussions. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to register our sincere appreciation and gratitude to the entire IOU organizing committee for both events the one in the, held in the Gambia and this one. These members of staff are very dynamic and supportive in every sense of the word. They consistently and persistently worked out all the details to get us to this point. Alhamdulillah. To all of you out there, I say al -barka. And to my very own assistant, who is no other than Masane Cham in the Gambia. Special thanks to you, Brainy Mas. Of special mention is my co-host, Brother Safwan Ibrahim, the IOU representative in Malaysia and the digital marketing executive, who is so full of ideas and very creative in his approach alongside the media and the graphics teams, including those in the Gambia. Brothers and sisters, shukran katir. My dear audience, I cannot conclude without saying the biggest thank you to the most important individual present here today. And guess who that individual is? It is no other than you, the audience. 
IOU extends the biggest thank you to all of you here present for taking time off your busy schedules to attend this event. We look forward to meeting you soon in our next series of webinars, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to introduce you to our course in Islamic psychology. Islamic psychology is a new field. It is something which is lacking in most Muslim countries. We have psychology, yes, Western psychology, which has its own uh, basis and approach to understanding human beings, how they think, how they react, how they interact. Islamic psychology is based on the fact that human beings have a soul. Western psychology don't believe in the soul. They observe animals and the way that animals operate, they've drawn certain conclusions and they've applied that to human beings. But we are more than just animals. So Islamic psychology seeks to bring human beings into the holistic picture of life on earth. And this area of study is vital for the development of our institutions, I mean, even in businesses, even in the military or in whatever field. Psychology has a role. So we invite you to join the International Open University and to enter into this new field of Islamic psychology, to make a difference in the future for human beings in the world in general. It is a new and challenging field which I'm sure those of you who have this inclination would greatly enjoy. So commit yourselves to study from this Islamic perspective. Psychology needs this guidance. Be the leaders in this field to create a new world vision for understanding human beings and how they interact. So my brothers and sisters, those of you who have this inclination, we welcome you to join the Department of Islamic Psychology in the International Open University. We welcome you on board to share with the great uh, scholars that we have connected to us, as well as with the younger and new scholars who are graduating in this field. Thank you for giving me of your time, and we hope that this time will have served you well. <laughs>